The regular notice requirement of the New Jersey Open Public Meetings Act has been complied with and that adequate advance notice of this meeting was given at least 48 hours in advance. On October 15, 2015, notice was mailed to the Courier Post. Notice was also posted on a bulletin board located by the reception desk at the central office in all school building bulletin boards within the district. Roll call. Ms. Teresa Atwood. Present. Mr. Jose Buito Bueno. Present. Ms. Dorothy Burley. Here. Ms. Taisha Manier. Present. Minister Wasim Muhammad. Present. Mrs. Felicia Reyes Morton. Here. Mrs. Martha Wilson. Present. Ms. Catherine Blackshear. We have a quorum. Thank you. Would you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I will now turn the board meeting over to the board business administrator. The board will now go into closed session to discuss matters of personnel, safety, security, and attorney-client privileges. We will be gone for about 30 minutes and will return at 6.05. Motion. <coughs> Motion to go into closed session. Second. Second. We are now going into closed session Would made by oh, no Ms. Teresa Atwood. Yes. Mr. Jose Buito Bueno. Yes. Ms. Dorothy Burley. Yes. Ms. Taisha Minir. Yes. Minister Wasim Muhammad. Yes. Mrs. Felicia Reyes Morton. Yes. Mrs. Martha Wilson. Yes. Ms. Catherine Blackshear. All in favor to go into closed, say yes. 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 All opposed say no. We are now in closed session. At this time, I call for a motion to come out of close. Motion to come out of close. Do I have a second? Second. <laughs> motion to come out of close was made by Minister Wasim Muhammad and Mr. Jose Brito Bueno. I'm going to do roll call. Ms. Teresa Atwood. Yes. Mr. Jose Brito Bueno. Present. Ms. Dorothy Burley. Yes. Ms. Taisha Minir. Yes. Minister Wasim Muhammad. Yes. Mrs. Felicia Reyes Morton. Yes. Mrs. Martha Wilson. Yes. Ms. Catherine Blackshear. All in favor coming out of closed say yes. 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 All opposed say no. We are now out of closed session. So all I'm going to do is At this time, we will turn the meeting over to Mr. Paymon or Hanifer. Great, thank you. So we are going, the, the board members on stage and our staff are going to move down to the front row and we're going to pull down um, for the presentation. All right, is everyone situated? Great. So good evening, everyone. We are going to begin tonight's board meeting by swearing in our newest student board members, uh, which is always uh, an exciting development for us. So uh, with no further ado, I'm gonna invite up our general counsel, Bryant Horsley, who will lead the swearing in process for uh, our exalted board, student board members to my right. And you can see their names here from each of our represented schools. So Bryant. All right, so one by one, I want you to state your full name loud and clear, starting with, with you. Samuel Gray. Yeah, Bob Mark. Daddy and Kristen. Alexis Hawkins. I love you. Okay, Sky Hawkins. Okay, all at the same time, please repeat after me and raise your right hand. I affirm that I, affirm that. I, will, support I will support the Constitution of the United States, of the United States. and the Constitution of the state of New Jersey, of the state of New Jersey. And, that and that I will bear true faith and allegiance, and allegiance to, the same, to the same and to the governments, to the governments established, in the States, established in the United States and this state, and this state under, the under the authority 
of the people. I affirm that I possess the qualifications prescribed by law for the office of member of a student board of education and that I will faithfully, impartially and justly perform all the duties of that office according to the best of my ability. Congratulations. So I think this is now my third year working with Timir on the student board, um, second year with Dania, and for the others I've recently met and uh, had an opportunity to spend a considerable amount of time with them and some other student leaders, uh, which we'll actually get to in the presentation tonight, but just want to say how impressed I've been in our first meeting with the, uh, uh, the thoughtfulness and the questions they've asked and their advocacy on behalf of their students, and so we're thrilled to have you all. Uh, leading our uh, students here, and so thank you, thank you again for your commitment and service, and congratulations. All right, so a few district updates, and then we'll close it out with some highlights, and then we have a uh, one of our board members will uh, uh, make a presentation, kind of a special guest presentation that we have for this evening. So. I'm looking at my team because I think we're going to kick things off with a video, and a lot of you all know that we recently uh, released our new strategic plan called All Schools Rise, similar to uh, the first strategic plan, both of which are under the umbrella of the Camden Commitment, and this is phase two, All Schools Rise. Uh, the uh, effort began with many, many rounds of community dialogue, uh, open town hall meetings, over 500 completed surveys, which have now informed uh, the current plan. So. Uh, with no further ado, we're going to show you all a brief video. For those of you that didn't see this, we uh, showed this video during the uh, press conference where we first announced the plan. Camden kids, they have amazing abilities and extraordinary potential. They become doctors and actors and leaders in their community. So how can the excellence of our schools match the excellence of our kids? That's what the Camden Commitment is set out to do. Superintendent Rahanafar released the strategic plan in January of 2014 after a 100-day listening tour. Based on community feedback, the Camden Commitment focused on five areas. Safety, buildings and technology, teaching and learning, parent engagement, and central office effectiveness. For a year and a half, the Camden Commitment drove progress across the city. The graduation rate went up, more kids enrolled in preschool than ever before, and students, staff, and parents all reported feeling safer. So we can build from here. A summer of community engagement led to an updated plan called All Schools Rise. We kept the same promises, but we came up with new steps we'll take to get there. For safety, that means reducing out-of-school suspensions and creating more positive school environments. For buildings and technology, that means quicker technology support to schools and seeing through two new neighborhood school buildings as well as a handful of renovations. When it comes to Promise 3, the focus is on excellent schools. There's more coaching for teachers and school leaders, and more Renaissance schools are an option to increase the number of great neighborhood schools. We'll make the way for parents to enroll their children in public schools fairer and easier. And we'll explore new vocational programs and new curriculum in science and social studies. Promise 4 makes life easier for parents by introducing text messaging as a way to learn more information. And Promise 5 says the central office will be helpful resource, moving more funding to schools, giving preference to local businesses whenever possible, and answering all questions that come in. There's a lot of work ahead of us but ultimately we believe that these steps with your support and the hard work of our students and staff will help lead our goal of every student getting an excellent education. May all schools rise.
Huge thanks to our communications team and everyone else who helped put that video together. So I won't get into too many of the details because you heard it in that video, but just uh, what I'll do is for each of the promises, I'll, I'll, I'll pick a couple highlights and then we'll, um, we'll move on. So with promise one with uh, safe students, safe schools, as uh, the moderator in the video mentioned, there is a focus uh, on reducing out of school suspensions. We've discussed it at board meetings in the past. We are certainly moving forward with that plan beginning with school leader training and teacher training. And so we've talked about the, the importance of restorative justice. That's not to say there won't be consequences. We had a great conversation with our student board members about this. It doesn't mean that students can act out and break rules. Uh, suspensions will still be um, a, a consequence as, uh, as part of school discipline. However, we cannot reflexively suspend students for minor infractions, which have happened in the past year, such as a student showing up uh, without their uniform on. Uh, that student should not be sent home. That student should not be suspended for that type of violation. And so we need consistency and we need to, you know, as the, uh, as the term restorative justice would imply, we need to work to show love and care uh, for our students, even those that may at times find themselves uh, in trouble uh, in school and out of school. And so that is the thinking and we are actively continuing that dialogue here uh, within our schools. On 21st century buildings, the main focus here is on moving forward with the plans that we've announced and having a sense of urgency to develop new plans to improve our uh, facilities. So we've announced Camden High School, we've announced Renaissance School renovations, uh, Kip Cooper Norcross is now open. However, with the plans that we've announced and, and the shovel still hasn't hit the dirt, there is a lot of work that needs to happen. We have to be incredibly vigilant. We have to stay on top of the School Development Authority, particularly on Camden High School, to ensure that that plan comes to fruition because uh, we all know that uh, certain promises were made in the past that weren't always delivered upon. And so that is the hard work that we are continuing to move forward. Uh, and a number of our team members are, are in constant dialogue with the state on that front. Third, on excellent schools. So as you'll see here, uh, under Promise 3 is where you see the most number of goals, which certainly makes sense because uh, curriculum, instruction, teaching and learning, that is the core function of the school district. So. Uh, it would certainly make sense for there to be so many goals there. What I'll quickly note here is that we are rolling out a new curriculum, uh, math and literacy, grades K to 12. Uh, we're working out kinks. There's a feedback loop where we're getting feedback from teachers. It was actually a round table, teacher round table earlier today uh, where we're making sure that uh, all of their questions are being answered and that school leaders are really equipped to be able uh, to respond to questions and issues that are coming up. Uh, but it's very exciting to have developed this new curriculum. It takes a lot of time to develop new curriculum as uh, those who are close to this work um, can, can testify. <coughs> Fourth, with parent engagement, the big initiative to note here is, and I, uh, we had a conversation with our student board members most recently, but I've also spent a lot of time with families. We're trying to make the enrollment process easier for families in Camden. Uh, so one of the very first concerns I heard during my uh, first 100 days in the district was that the district special transfer process was way too complicated. Uh, there's a parent who I can remember told me that she had to go to her school building seven different times to uh, effectively finalize the special transfer for students. So the special transfer process, for you that don't know it, it's if you're transferring your child from one district school to another district school. And so for that parent, she shouldn't have to go to the school building seven different times. And for other families that are making similar school choices on behalf of their young people, uh, they shouldn't have to jump through so many hoops. So right now, if you're looking at five different schools and say one of them is a charter, one of them is a renaissance, and one of them is a traditional public school, each school has a different application, different timeline, different criteria, and that just makes life too complicated, particularly for our working families who don't have that spare time during the day. Uh, and so uh, what we're moving forward with is one application for all schools to make life easier uh, and to create more equitable access to our schools. Fifth, with central office effectiveness, the same theme as we've discussed in the past, which is really the central office needs to continue to do more with less. And I say that knowing that a number of our staff are in our building that is falling apart uh, with internet doesn't, uh, that doesn't always work. My office, internet goes in and out. Uh, so it's not to say that we are rich with resources in the central office. However, we need to uh, streamline resources to make sure that uh, we are investing first at the school level and we are making certain sacrifices, continuing to make certain sacrifices within the uh, district central office. 
Okay, so a few uh, updates to provide you all here. So first, uh, the state, for those of you that uh, didn't catch this earlier today, uh, released uh, the park results statewide. We do not yet have district results. Uh, so the only results that we, uh, that we all collectively have access to is, uh, are the statewide results. So I thought it would be a, just a good opportunity to kind of remind us of how park fits in to graduation requirements. And so, a no, actually a, number, a couple of students asked, asked me about this uh, recently at Brent. Uh, what, where we last left things off in our conversation here at board meetings was that uh, the current ninth grade class would be the first class where the park assessment uh, would be the graduation requirement. So right now, there are a number of different pathways a student can take. They can take the SAT, the ACT, Accuplacer, and so on. Uh, and so it's really the current ninth grade class, once they are uh, in their junior and senior years, is when the park assessment would be a graduation. But that's now changed. So that's where we left things off. And so now it's the eighth grade class. The state bumped it back by one more year. So current eighth graders will be the first class where park will be a graduation requirement. And so it's also worth mentioning, and this is an important point, that both currently and as far as we have been told, moving forward, there will also be an appeals process. So a number of our students do graduate through the appeals pathway, and we're gonna continue to monitor this with our um, state liaisons, but uh, we anticipate the appeals process will continue to be in effect, and so I just wanted to make that clear because I know a number of questions have come up on that front in my, um, in my passing dialogue with, with some of you. All right, so just a few items I wanted to, um, to highlight. So recent events, it was uh, recently Respect Week, and this is an initiative that came out of the 2011 Anti-Bullying Act. And so statewide, uh, earlier this month, all schools were to hold events to uh, promote the importance of positive behavior and anti-bullying within our schools. And so these are just a, a few pictures uh, of students and, uh, at a handful of schools. This is a Woodrow Wilson, actually, uh, which is a pledge against violence during res um, the Week of Respect. Back to school nights. So those happened fairly recently. I know a number of you all uh, were in attendance. Uh, the top left is at Yorkship, which is actually where I attended with my son and the Camden Sophisticated Sisters performed there. Huge, huge turnout. Uh, as I was told, really great turnout across all of our schools, which is really encouraging. Uh, so. Uh, big kudos to the principals, uh, the community school coordinators, and all the other staff uh, that helped uh, get the families out, and of course, the families themselves who took the time out of their busy schedules to, um, to engage with their schools. So the other pictures here are at Veterans, Sharp, H.P. Wilson, Dudley, and Caddo. This is just a quick uh, of, um, overview of, a, of an event we had uh, at Veterans. So. Uh, this is a veteran school participating in a fire safety demonstration during National Fire Safety Week that their school passed along and just wanted to share out with everyone here. We recently had uh, a parent programming session at Yorkship, uh, and so these families were able to learn more about uh, their kids' health and wellness and how to best uh, nourish them, and so it was just programming uh, with that focus in mind uh, to best support our families in supporting their young people. So I mentioned a little bit earlier that we've had a number of uh, student roundtable conversations. I had one meeting with uh, our student board members and I also have just gone to each of the high schools and sat down with a large number of their students. And, and I just want to reinforce again just how blown away I, uh, I was in those conversations by uh, the insightfulness of the questions, uh, the leadership in the room. I mean, these are a group of students that care deeply about their schools, about their school district, and asked some really tough questions. And we really covered a lot of ground from health care in Camden to should girls be disallowed to wear headbands at Brim Medical, which is a, a hot topic conversation uh, at Brim Medical. So, uh, so really thoughtful discussion, and we're going to continue to have uh, future conversations with our students to make sure that they uh, know that their voice uh, is incredibly important and uh, for all of the adult conversation that we all have and we certainly value and respect that uh, our students are living this uh, day in and day out and uh, and their voice is so so critical in informing our broader thinking and our broader plans 
Custodial Appreciation Day was uh, on October the 2nd, and so uh, at, at our central office we honored uh, our staff, uh, and I wanted to just get out and, 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 and get to know and, and spend some time with some of our custodial staff inside of our school. So uh, this is uh, Miss Jackie Thomas. For those of you that don't know her, she's phenomenal. Um, she's the head custodian at Kramer School. Uh, I see some uh, smiles in the audience. Uh, I imagine those who know Jackie. If you walk into Kramer, uh, the first thing you notice is it is just immaculate, uh, especially on the first floor, but second floor as well. And it's really a testament to Jackie. And she drives the teachers in that building nuts in all the right ways uh, because she stays on top of them to make sure that they're working with their students to clean up their classrooms and keep the hallways clean. And it really takes a team effort, but Jackie is. Uh, is really the leader of that effort. Uh, so it was neat to spend a little bit of time with her um, as she was uh, working hard at Kramer. This is a recent parent meeting we had uh, in North Camden. Uh, so a, a number of parents in North Camden had asked to meet with me uh, to talk about uh, a handful of top of mind issues that, um, uh, that they felt was necessary to communicate directly to me and our staff. So we, we covered a lot of ground there from uh, the importance of, importance of early childhood to North Camden uh, feeling as though their students traveling all the way to Woodrow Wilson wasn't the right fit for a lot of their kids and they would prefer to have a more local uh, high school option there. So just you know, traveling, safety, pre-K, covered a lot of ground and I appreciate the time uh, that they took out of their busy schedules to sit down with our staff. Canoe Mobile, so there was uh, uh, someone in the audience on behalf of Canoe Mobile who spoke at our last board meeting, so just wanted to follow up and, uh, and show that students from Bonzel, Cooper's Point, and Brim all participated in the recent Canoe Mobile trip. Uh, so they learned about water safety skills, paddling techniques, uh, and a little bit of just about the aquatic ecosystems here uh, in Camden. Um, so this is, uh, I think, a trip we've now done two or three years in a row, maybe even longer. Uh, so it's great, great for those kids to have those opportunities. And nearing the end here, there was a great article in the Courier Post about our partnership with um, Classroom Champions. So Steve Messler is, is the, the head of this organization. Uh, he's an Olympic gold medalist himself, uh, and, he, and, and as the CEO, he's taken a particular interest in Camden. I mean, it's a, they're in a lot of different districts nationwide. Um, and so here, this is a picture of him visit, visiting, uh, is it the Wiggins School? Yeah, it's the Wiggins School. And so this year our classroom teachers are, um, uh, as part of classroom um, champions, are Miss Kelly Warden Davis, who was last year's South Jersey Teacher of the Year Award winner, Miss Cindy Martinez, Miss Sharon Vogel, Miss Nicole Almanzer, Miss Christine Nemeth, and Miss Otney Khan. Uh, and uh, Miss April Holmes was also involved in this effort, who uh, I know a lot of you all know and respect. So before we go on to the stage and recognize our retirees, I want to welcome up uh, our board member, Minister Wasim Mohammed. Those of you that were in attendance at the last board meeting, we shared that Minister Mohammed, um, uh, with his congregation, w traveled to Washington, D.C. Uh, for the 10th anniversary of the Million Man March, and I wanted to give him uh, the opportunity to talk about the experience they had as a number of Camden students and parents and stakeholders joined, joined him on that trip. So we're going to get that presentation and video set up here as Minister Wasim comes to the stage. Thank you. As we take a moment to um, uh, greetings um, before I go on, as we take a minute to get the, uh, the technology together, I want to first thank um, our superintendent here, Mr. Payman Rahanafer, for the opportunity to present um, to you the 20th anniversary of the Million Man March, Justice or Else, convened by Minister Louis Farrakhan of the Nation of Islam. Um, just real quick, and I also, there's a few other people, and I would like to thank as they're getting this together, is our, of course, our advisory board members um, under the direction of President Ms. Catherine Blackshear and Vice President Ms. Martha Wilson and all the board members that sit with me, I thank you for the opportunity. And also I would like to thank our mayor, Mayor Dana Red of the city of Camden and her partnership with Temple Number no. 20 and her staff, particularly Ms. Novella Starks Henson 
and her staff for the opportunity to partner with um, the efforts of the mobilization of this 20th anniversary of the Million Man March. So as they're getting it together, I'm just trying to uh, go on. I don't have an issue and in, in, uh, keep babbling as a minister. We can go on. I must confess that uh, that dream that I had that day has at many points turned into a nightmare. This is a little short clip we're going to show you to you from the Reverend Doctor, the late and great Reverend Doctor Martin Luther King. Um, I must confess and I, that after that it's over with, we'll. That dream that And as they get together, I guess I can take some time to get this together. What this uh, 20th anniversary of the Million Man March, Justice or Else, was about, it was a, a once again, as I said, convened I by the national that, uh, representative of the Nation of Islam, Minister Louis Farrakhan, whom in conjunction with Dr. Martin Luther King's son, Martin Luther King III, he, the spirit of this Million Man March anniversary was said or so about the, the night before Dr. King was assassinated, Dr. King was writing notes of what his next, next speech was going to be about. And in his room there in Memphis, Tennessee, he had wrote a few notes and Minister Farrakhan, along with the son of the late and great Dr. Martin Luther King, sat down and talked about what they could do now with this particular march that was on Washington, which really is not necessarily a march. It is exactly more of a movement to get people organized and mobilized in their community again. 20 years ago, on the mall in Washington, D.C., um, October 16, 2000, I mean, 1995, uh, the country and this, the, this country witnessed one of the largest rally, with the largest rally ever in American history which they, this particular rally um, where there was no fighting, no um, violence, no arrest, you know, as we say in our community, no smoking, no drinking, all of these type of things. It was, it was sober-minded men who went to Washington, D.C. 20 years ago to atone for um, and reconcile our differences of, in our community and to reconcile our inability to be active in our communities. That, what the th that was the theme 20 years ago. And rally up to now, the theme changed just a little bit based on recent public events that's been going on around the country. So with that, we would like to show this short clip. Thank you. if we can. Well, we do apologize. And um, But I'll go after, and then we can watch the video. Hopefully, it comes on. So, for the sake of time, and we do apologize and, and value your time here. Twenty years ago, on the Mall, in Washington D.C., the Million Man March was convened by Minister Louis Farrakhan, the national representative of the Nation of Islam, with the purpose of gathering men, black men, together to atone and reconcile for, to their families for uh, uh, for their indiscretions and their inability to move in their communities and some of the mistakes that we made in our communities along the way.
The call yielded over 2 million men on the Mall in Washington, D.C. for a peaceful, highly spirited gathering um, on the Mall in Washington, D.C. There, the men pledged to return back to their communities and get involved in their communities. They pledged for, uh, uh, to join organizations, the NAACP, the Urban League, the local organizations, get involved with the school board elections, get involved with the schools, and all of these things they did as men to uh, atone for these. Now, 20 years later, as a result of different movements going on in America with uh, Occupy, Wall Street, um, the traumatic uh, events of Trayvon Martin, Mike Brown, Tamir Rice, and others, and the inception of Black Lives Matter, uh, the, it sparked the 20th year anniversary of the Million Man in March, which is justice or else. Now, the or else has sometimes got some people a little um, uh, upset or shrink in, or, or, or just bring interest to the word what else. A lot of people were surprised that the what else was coming from a lecture or the writings that I described earlier from Dr. Martin Luther King as he was writing his next notes for his next speech in that room there in Memphis, Tennessee at the um, Lorraine Hotel, which is the National Witcher Golf. So we're gonna show this video so you can get it from there. Right, ma'am. Now the other thing that we've got to come to see now that many of us didn't see too well during the last 10 years, and that is that racism Not guilty. is still alive in American society and much more widespread. A handful of protests, a handful of uh, criminals uh, and thugs who... Many in moments of anger, Many in moments of deep bitterness engage in riots. And as long as America postpones justice, we stand in the position of having these recurrences of violence and riots over and over again. Social justice and progress are the absolute guarantors of riot prevention. Mr. Gray's death was a homicide. The Negro was freed from the bondage of physical slavery. The athletes marched onto a stage. Where but at the same time, the nation refused to give him land to make that freedom meaningful. Freedom without land to cultivate. Freedom and famine at the same time. And create jobs for our people. And create jobs for Negro our people. is to be free, he must move down into the inner resources of his own soul and sign with a pen and ink of self-assertive manhood his own emancipation proclamation. But I want to get the language right tonight. I want to get the language so right that everybody here will cry out, yes, I'm black, I'm proud of it, I'm black and beautiful. Individually, we are poor when you compare us with white society in America. We are poor. Collectively, we are richer than all the nations with the exception of nine. That's power right there if we know how to prove it. We begin the process of building a great economic base. And at the same time, we are putting pressure where it really hurts. We don't have to argue with anybody. We just need to go around to these stores and to these massive industries in our country. Say, God sent us by here to say to you that you're not treating his children right. 
we come by here to ask you to make the first item on your agenda bad treatment where God's children are concerned. Now, if you are not prepared to do that, we do have an agenda that we must follow. And our agenda calls for withdrawing economic support from you. We mean business now, and we are determined to gain our rightful place in God's world. Thank you. With that, as we get the PowerPoint together, I just wanted to tell some of the, especially some of the young people who are here that as we always go back and look at our history here in America, our history has always not been so great here in America. We opened up doors for many. Um, talking about black people in America, we opened up doors for uh, a lot of uh, disenfranchised people. But nevertheless, the doors we opened up, the civil rights movement and the black power movement served as examples for people all throughout the world and of, of their civil protests against governments, civil protests against large groups of bodies. So as we don't allow others to give uh, a, a historical documentation on some of our leaders that we have to go back and take another look at the life of Dr. Martin Luther King and his evolution from the 1963 I Have a Dream speech. This, what we just played for you was from uh, most of those clips were from 1968. And Dr. King, a lot of people don't know, was a rogue minister at the time. His life, he was jeopardized. He was considered to be a rogue minister because of his stance that he took towards, as so many others like Muhammad Ali and so many other great Americans, that he took a stand against the Vietnam War, about the America's war on the, on, on the poor, that they felt as though they were given more money towards to fight a war in Vietnam in which they promised to fight the war on the poor. And because of that, Dr. King, he was not allowed to even enter into some churches. So as he reclaimed his power base, he was going around, as you can see, he was trying to say he was wanted to galvanize uh, people about withdrawing the power base that we have in our community that we so uh, uh, faithfully give away and then sit back and complain of what we don't have. So what we're, the spirit of the 20th anniversary, that justice or else, the or else is about withdrawing our economic base, withdrawing certain bases that we have. As you can see from the clip that there was, uh, you know, we spend $1.3 trillion talking about black people in America. But yet, we seems to be high on the rate of unemployed, high on um, poverty, and that's because we don't bargain or, or put together our collective dollars because so many of our dollars leave our community. And this is why we are so grateful to partner with uh, not only the Camden Board of Education, uh, me personally as a board member, but to partner even with the other side of the 20th anniversary of the Million Man March, the justice talking about the rogue killings between some police officer. But here in Camden City, I must truly say, with the Camden County Metro Police Department, we have gotten in front of the fight that other communities like Ferguson and other communities around the country is getting in so much trouble uh, uh, about. We have gotten in front of the problem, in front of the problem, I believe. Of course, there's a lot of work that needs to be done, but if you look at it, some of the things that we're asking for is we're asking that people like myself, a local minister Muslim, a Muslim minister who at times it seems that the Muslims have been on the outside of the community, that, we, that you will have Muslims involved in not only policing and education because We've always opened up our doors for all religions and the foundation of what America was built on, which is the foundation and the spirit of the 20th anniversary of the Million Man March. That was not just a Muslim march, that was a march convened by the local organizing committees 
all around the country. And I would like to take this time to thank the Camden LOC, Local Organizing Committee, which was uh, directed by uh, Brother Swadi Abdul Malik. And I also would like to thank the local Muslim uh, mosque here in the city of Camden, Minister Omar Kareem. And I also would like to thank uh, Reverend Kevin Washington of Bethel Deliverance Baptist Church. And I also uh, would like to thank our, our former um, councilman, Ali Salone L, and the United Neighbors of Whitman Park and their members. And last but certainly not least, I would like to thank the members of Muhammad's Temple of Islam number 20, which I reside as the minister for all their efforts of organizing and mobilizing people for this great day. And they say that uh, the march was so nice that the minister had to do it twice. And uh, you know, we had over two million men show up on the mall 20 years ago. This mall numbers are going from 800,000 to almost, uh, uh, I have the clicker to go to picture. I ain't going to know how to work this thing and talk at the same time. I'm just not that good at it with, uh, um, as our superintendent in here. But if we right here. Okay, we got it. Here we go. As we can look at some of these pictures before, as I wind down, uh, this was the Holy Day of Atonement, which was 20 years ago, um, convened at the mall in Washington. I had the opportunity to be on the stage then and to see sea of men um, um, sober, sober-minded, and as we always say, this march was not just a Muslim march. It was all types of black men, all types of Latino men, all types of Native American men, and even white men were present at that particular march who was in, um, in um, consolidating with our efforts there in the city of Washington, DC. There we also have um, a peaceful another look at the events 20 years ago. Twenty years later, after Occupy Wall Street and Trayvon Martin, it was once. It was also awesome to get to, to see Trayvon Martin's mother speak at this march. As a result, as she's still fighting for justice for Trayvon and Tamir Rice in Cleveland, and um, just the whole Black Lives Matter movement. As I stated earlier, the Camden Local Orga Organizing Committee, which made up of the Camden LOC and the local mosque here in the city of Camden under Minister Omar Kareem and the efforts of uh, Reverend Kevin Washington of Bethel Deliverance Church and myself and members of Temple Number 20. We organized to get uh, buses. I believe it was uh, 10 buses that Camden took down to Washington, D.C. amidst the many people who took the train down and just drove down for whatever crazy reason they did that for and driving down with all those millions of people uh, they have there. And there's some of the, um, this march was uh, part of men, women, and children. It was not a million man march. It was a march with men, women, children, uh, and others from, out, from various communities throughout America. There's some more of the pictures that I took with uh, actually my cell phone. Uh, once again, I had the opportunity to be on stage at this march, and it was a wonderful opportunity uh, uh, to drive with the, um, um, on the bus, they had it well organized. We drove, I mean, we, we drove to uh, RFK Stadium. There at RFK Stadium, they dropped all the buses off and we walked um, like a ceremonial walk and made it a march to the mall in Washington, D.C. We caught the metro train to uh, uh, the Capitol building in there. That's some of the ceremonial walk there. It was a wonderful experience to experience that many people in peace, love, and solidarity. It, it was wonderful to take some of the students from uh, the University of Islam, the, our private school that we have here in Camden, and also some of the students from the public school systems that was there as well too, and the Renaissance schools as well, some of the charter schools of those children were there too. There's a picture of myself and some of the students of the University of Islam taken there at the march there. A few of them are my children, uh, the Capitol building, some of the people protesting there, and they had the opportunity to help do a pre-rally march with minister, the minister in uh, Chicago there where we met and um, had a uh, wonderful private conversation with him. And just to note that as we have that here, Minister Farrakhan was very supportive of what's going on here in Camden. As we witnessed here when the governor came here, uh, I believe it was a year ago, 
and the governor talked about, to this very building, he talked about the collaborative effort that Camden had of moving things forward with the collaboration with many community members, churches, mosques, synagogues, people in the community, community organizations, the opportunity to work together to move our city forward. Because as you know, in our communities, our communities are way, have way too many problems for us to be disconnected and disunited as we're fighting for the same thing, which is freedom, justice, and equality for our people. He was on our radio program and he gave kudos to the mayor, the school superintendent, and for the governor and everybody working in Camden, working collaborative, collaborative together in this particular march. There we also had a wonderful opportunity the day before the march to meet with our congressman, Congressman Donald Norcross, who was well in support. He was very active in support of this 20th year anniversary, justice or else. Uh, we had uh, lunch with him and discussed some wonderful things and some things that we can do, continue to do here in the city of Camden. We thought that was very admirable and honorable of our local congressman here in, um, the, in our area. Uh, there, as you see, had the opportunity to sit on the stage with in, uh, um, just to say to my children, you know, who was there present, they said, oh, dad, you were there. You got to see, I don't know some of these young rappers, J. Cole, or I don't know some of these names. I'm still in the public enemy days, but these young people know who I'm talking about. But some of the rappers and the entertainers, uh, uh, Russell Simmons were there. But I was letting some of the, uh, my children know that for once, um, in our lifetime, I got the opportunity to see it twice. It was great to see those stars and entertainment stars come to recognize uh, the work and efforts that we've been doing here in America for 85 years, that they came to honor the works of uh, the Nation of Islam that is doing to galvanize our people and to make this march inclusive among all. Okay, there we go, remembrance. As you can see, our Native American brothers spoke there and spoke well of their community. And uh, another picture there from the march. I almost got threw out of the march there because I went on the steps to take a picture. And the uh, Capitol Police there almost threw me out of there. And I think, and last, I want to say that a lot of times we uh, don't get a, a lot of uh, um, effort to the works some of the brothers called the FOI do. This is the second time that at the end of this march of a million people galvanizing on the Capitol there in Washington, D.C., that we helped to save the federal government money because it was the brothers from the Nation of Islam who once again, for the second time, stayed there until the mall was, was spotless as the way it was before we took over to rent um, the area that we have because marches are not free. The march cost an estimate over $3 million that was raised independently. And this is sometimes when you raise money independently, then you can have the freedom to move and say some things that sometimes not always, uh, sometimes we think need to be said, but when you have corporate rations that pay for what you need to say, sometimes you cannot say it. So I think that's another mark that of what our show of unity and economic support of what we can do in our community. There it is. And um, the excerpt of the march was, uh, like I said, the, the conversation that those speakers had came from a, um, the notes of Dr. Martin Luther King the night before he was assassinated of what he wanted to galvanize for in an economic boycott uh, for about the power and the spending power of black people in America. Once again, I thank you for your opportunity for to say these few words, and Superintendent, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Minister Rasim. So we're going to now move back up to the stage. At this time, I would like to read off the names of the retirements. If I mispronounce your name, I apologize in advance. Ms. Stella Nelson, teacher of special education, Location would be R.T. Cream Family School. She served 14 years and 11 months. Gail Blavitt, nurse at Whittier Elementary School, 17 years, four months. Maureen Flusher, teacher of special education, Yorkship Elementary School, 17 years and 10 months. Joan Ingram, teacher of English, LAL, at Hatch Family School, three years and nine months and Dinah 
Philo Navarosa, teacher of bi bilingual, Kramer College Preparatory Lab School for 25 years. On behalf of the Camden City Board of Education, we would like to thank you, each and every one of you, for your years of service. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. At this point, I want to turn the meeting over to Regina Robinson, our business administrator, to present the business office agenda items. Thank you, Superintendent, Superintendent Rohana Ford. The business office presents the following business office agenda items for approval, the bill list, the financial report, and 17 um, board agenda items for approval. <coughs> Any questions, comments? All right, so in accordance with the powers vested in the state district superintendent under Title 18A, I hereby approve today's superintendent agenda items and business office agenda items. I now want to turn it over to our student board representatives. And uh, I know that we got a quick introduction of each of you just uh, earlier, but I think it'd be great before you have any comments or questions that you'd like to share, just to quickly reintroduce yourself, name, grade, school, uh, and excited to have you all join here for the first meeting of the school year. So happy to start at any which end here. Start with medical arts here. Good evening, everybody. I'm Cameron Carter from Creative Arts. I'm a senior and I'm a dance major. And I just want to thank everybody for letting me have this opportunity one more time. And I am very excited to be among you guys because I look up to you guys. <laughs> um, I my issue right now with creative arts is that due to the layoffs we had to move our physics teacher to Camden High so now we don't have a physics class for the seniors and I know some of us wanted to take that class so we just want to know if we can get that back and I'm very excited that we are partnering with the settlement music school so now after school we have programs for the outside so they can come in and work with us and work with the music school as well so that's a good opportunity for the middle schoolers. It's not much for the high schoolers, but it's still good because we get to watch and see them. Um, coming up, the dancers are going to Denver to a black dance conference, and the jazz band is looking forward to many things. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Antoine Morrison. I'm a senior at Camden High School. My major is computer engineering, and I'm very good at it for the trade. I'm looking into a couple colleges for that trade. Um, but my main concern for my school would probably be to add a study hall or fund more to career shops for our students. Uh, that's all I have to share. Good evening, my name is Alexis Hawkins. I am a junior at Brent Medical Arts, and I just wanna say thank you guys so much. Um, I'm very honored to be sitting here before you guys as a school board representative for my school, Brent Medical Arts. And um, the only concern I have right now is that we need a new librarian, and I feel as though we should have one because students should be able to take books in and out and just um, research, have a little bit more research. Um, as well as the school lunch is not too good, and I know um, Mr. Rahana Forrest that he was working on that, so I can't wait. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Dania Krizen, and it's nice to see you all, and some of you again. I will be a excellent student representative because I am very outspoken, and because of my outgoing personality, it makes it easy for students, teachers, and staff to speak to me. I am very passionate about addressing the concerns of my school. I am excited to be a board rep because I'll be able to talk to all of you face-to-face, -face, personal, and lastly, this year, I am hoping to address to the board that Met East is more than just a small school, and it deserves all the attention and the needs to be met like all the other schools. And exam for example, the lunch program and our facility. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Tom Branch. I'm back here for my third year. Um, 
Uh, I would like to thank every, every, everyone for giving me this opportunity again. You can trust me. I will be a great board representative again this year. Um, just make sure that you support Medis High School with our projects because I, it starts with the community. We put our hard work and like our community, they do not always support us as a school. And that's kind of like unfair because every time Canada High or a school has something, there's someone always there to support. So don't forget about the big picture learning schools. Like we're doing big things too. So we have an upcoming haunted house event that we love, that we want everybody to come out to, tell your friends, your kids, your grandkids, friends. tell everybody. Um, that's around Halloween time. <laughs> the Medis Haunted House is October 30th and October 31st between 5.30 and 8. Thank you. team <laughs> effort. But, um, but look out for Medis because we are doing big things this year. Like the senior class, we're having several fundraisers. One of our fundraisers that we plan to have is a movie night. So we're planning to turn our school into a movie theater. And we would like for the entire community to come out with support. The tickets are going to be dirt cheap, but we're going to show you good movies. So just support us this year. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Beatrice Esqueldo. I am a student representative of Woodrow Wilson High School. I want to thank everyone for coming. Um, I'm here to represent my school, and I would like everyone to see the picture and hear the truth and not what other people say about my school. Thank you. Great, thank you all very much. And as a couple, do we have one more? Oh. Hi. Um, my name is Kyla Evans. I'm in Cannon High with Antoine. Um, thank you for giving me this chance, this opportunity to work with the superintendent and the board of representatives so that I have a better outlook on how the schools are working and what will change for our schools. Um, my main concern, which I think is mutual for all of our schools, are our lunches. And I believe that students should have the opportunity to leave the building. Of course, we're going to use our IDs to get in and out. But I believe that students should be able to be trusted and given these different chances, even if it's just for like a year for us to try it out to see if it'll work. But um, that's one of our concerns. And as Antoine mentioned, funding our different career programs, because that's, that's what we're going to do in the future. So we should focus more on that rather than, no, I'm not going to say that. But I, I just believe that they should rather um, fund our career programs. Thank you. Great. Thank you all so much. And as a couple students mentioned, we are actively working through some of the uh, questions and issues that they've raised. So for example, on the staffing front, uh, Alexa's raised uh, access to science, particularly physics, at the 12th grade. Antoine, you raised programming concerns. So you know, these are issues that our team is looking into, and we're going to follow up with you all directly. And you can then uh, turn key that information to the rest of your schools. And as the Medis representative just did, uh, whenever there's an event that uh, you believe that we should be aware of, and obviously you want to drive a big turnout, please do share the specifics. And we can also not only help you get turnout, but we'll take pictures of the event, put it on social media, celebrate it here um, at, at board meetings. So um, please do um, keep us up to date there. So thank you all again. So I think we're now going to transition to public commentary. Rules for public comment. The Camden City School District welcomes the attendance and comments from all members of the public at its meetings. This public comment period is your time to be heard on the agenda items in this meeting. Each person who signed up to comment will have three minutes. You will be notified when your three minutes are up. You cannot yield your time to another person. When it is your turn to speak, please remain at the podium and address all of your comments to the board president or the superintendent. Please conduct yourself in a respectful and courteous manner for anyone whose comments or actions either harass, intimidate, or threaten the safety of any person. We will provide you with a warning or immediately end your comment time. Also, if you curse, use vulgar language, or make personal attacks, we will provide you with a warning or end your comment time. We will not interrupt you during your three minutes of comments. Members of the audience should also not interrupt the speaker at the podium. If you have any questions, please ask your questions during your three minute comment period. After the public comment period is closed, the superintendent or his designee will address your questions to the extent provided by law. First speaker, Keith Benson. So before Mr. Benson comes up, I wanted to just quickly respond. I 
I forgot to mention the food issue. So just to summarize where the, what the students have been conveying to us, there are two key challenges. One is kind of the breadth of choices at certain schools, and the second being portion size. And it, it is a serious matter, particularly with student athletes burning a lot of calories, need more food, five chicken nuggets isn't gonna do the job. So it is something that we are actively discussing with, uh, with Aramark to, um, to hopefully alleviate sooner than later. So I just wanted to quickly point that out. Mr. Benson, go ahead. Um, the first thing I'd like to say is um, welcome to the student reps. It is um, important that you guys understand you have a very important job to do. It's very easy to be sort of get lost in the idea that you represent your school, and make sure you're in your best behavior, and all these sorts of things. But the reality is you have to, you're speaking for hundreds of people who don't have that avenue to do it themselves. So take that responsibility pretty seriously, because you guys are leaders. Um, I usually come here and talk about my concerns with the Board of Education not voicing things or calls it, calls it, calling attention to issues that are very serious, but you know they just sort of just happen and um, they rarely ever get addressed. But that's not the topic I want to discuss today. Um, I was seeing on like a lot of social media that, that the hashtag All Schools Rise, and it was um, you know it was something I always thought was pretty curious, and it was pretty interesting that today of all days is a day that a, a brief sort of uh, presentation was done on it. Um, but some of my thoughts were like, how can all schools rise when every year when the state is taken over, our public schools start off with numerous classroom vacancies? The most basic function of a school is the delivery of knowledge from instructor to student. Yet because of lack of planning and due diligence from human resources, our public schools routinely start the year off without subject teachers. How can all schools rise when since the state takeover, the district has shown a focused commitment to close neighborhood schools that have been the staples of their communities for generations? How can all schools rise when the existence of Renaissance schools hinges on the demise of our public schools? How can all schools rise if for one type of school to win, the other schools must lose? If indeed all schools rise was truthful, then there would never be any disparity in the treatment and resources we saw exhibited between the children at Bonzo School and Uncommon. In the same building, our children in a public school of Bonzo were forced to sweat like dogs why the uncommon floor enjoyed central air conditioning. Is that what all school really looks like? I mean, all school rise looks like? Because to me, that looks like separate and unequal. How can all schools rise when there has been a consistent whitening of staff in both schools in downtown? Whoever is in charge of hiring clearly does not understand that in education, race does matter. Research shows that minority students from low SES backgrounds do better academically when they have a teacher who looks like them leading instruction. Further, whoever is in charge of hiring should know that 50% of black teachers come from black colleges and that Esperanza College in Pennsylvania, as well as a host of Hispanic fraternities and sororities nearby, will be a, a great place to start to recruit the next generation of educators. But instead, our district recruits from Lily White resources, I mean, sources like TNTP and Teach for America, and we all know they are much more disconnected from the community and much more temporary. If all school rise was a genuine sentiment and not a platitude, this district would be aware of how white dominated managerial positions in this district have become. The district would realize that overlooking experience and invested and educated minorities is an affront to progress, not an expansion of a colorblind meritocracy. I know what discrimination is and how it functions. I know many black people who have applied for managerial positions who despite having more education and experience were never even granted an interview. Meanwhile, our district last month hired a white guy with a bachelor's degree who graduated in 2012 to a job paying them $90,000. That's not an environment where all schools rise. That says to me that this is an environment where only certain kinds of people rise. And I'm Thank finished. You, I'm almost Benson, finished. Your time is up. I'm almost done. The case in point, recently I came to high school, a new young white... Thank you, Mr. Benson. Your time is up. I'm going to call up the next speaker. Number two, Sarah Jocelyn. I wanted to speak about Park tonight. 
thank you for bringing it to people's attention that the overall state numbers have come out. I wanted to speak tonight because the park is a very important thing to be fully prepared, to have the resources available, and I know how hard this district worked to make that happen last year. Make sure that it's working for all of our students, for the students that are um, speaking other languages, that are having different abilities. Well, we need to test all of our students and make sure resources are available. One of the questions that was asked was about the availability of a librarian. Do we have libraries in our school? Do we make those resources available to our children who need to prepare for these tests? I, I compliment the, uh, the school on, on having the new revised curriculum that is consistent with the core standards, and I look forward to seeing the curriculum that will be for um, uh, the bilingual department coming forward. I also look forward to the curriculum on science and social studies. If we're going to have children that are educated to be global citizens, to deal with issues such as climate change, they need to be able to understand those issues. We need to have physics, we need to have chemistry, and we need to make it available to, to students to learn. So I, I encourage you to uh, consider the resources available, make them available to all the students so that we can have student success in, the, in this district for all students. I ask also when will we have a, another person on the school board. Thank you. Number three, T. Gibson. Number four, Robert Farmer. Good afternoon. Uh, good evening. I'd like also to welcome the students on, there, up to, up there on the board. Um, this is the beginning uh, for you taking control of your city. You know, stick with it. Learn as much as you can up there because we need we need you you guys as future leaders in this uh, city. So congratulations to each and every one of you. Um, I'd like to bring attention to. Um, uh, some con really, it's contractual um, terms in our uh, agreement with the board. Um, we having problems with the preschool over at ECDC with members, um, uh, pr um, parents not getting preps. Uh, they're serving uh, breakfast without pay. Mr. Superintendent, I think that we need to look into that before that situation gets out of control. Um, Principals are still assigning uh, uh, meetings on our uh, members' unassigned prep time, and some has even signed um, meetings on the unassigned time that's normally given before at, or at the end of the day. We need to check that out. Uh, the SGOs, we have had a lot of going back and forth with what is the percentage that uh, that's, uh, this district is going to follow. They said it was 85%. The principals are saying that, but uh, we had a meeting today, uh, and it's 75 across the board, and I think that a communique needs to go out to the administrators, the building principals, you know, so that process can move forward. Um, I've had a lot of parents calling uh, my office concerning about children not coming home with books uh, or, or um, technology to access books online. Um, I think that's going to be a problem in this district, especially when the parents start calling the union. So I think that has to be looked into as well. Um, I sent a letter to, uh, to you, Mr. Uh, Superintendent, concerning the observation of, um, of holidays, basically religious holidays in the city. Um, I just hope that you know, the protocol which was used for that particular group of, uh, of our members it is basically used across the board for all members that needs to observe uh, their own personal religious um, holidays. Also, um, I got a call from uh, Ms. Uh, Loretta Gooden uh, from the uh, uh, parent uh, commission, she's the president, 
Um, she would uh, like to, she's here today, matter of fact, and she would like to meet with the board afterwards to uh, discuss some of the items inside of the, uh, your report. Um, and basically, um, that's it. And once again, young people, we got it going on. Number five, Elizabeth Ortiz. Good evening. Last month, I asked parents to be an advocate for their child's education. There is nothing more precious than an education. We can be segregated, ridiculed, belittled, cast aside, but one thing that cannot be taken from us is our education. Once we have learned something, it cannot be taken away from us, much like the truth. Many of you may not be aware that your child might not have textbooks or workbooks for math and literacy, which are two major testic subjects. Please find out if your child does not have these vital materials. We are two months into the school year and these materials should have been here on the first day of school. It is unacceptable that they are not. These books should be copyrighted for the years 2011 to 2015 and made available to our children immediately. Situations like this are why our children do not test well. You have all this money, teachers have no resources for major subjects, so they do their best with what they can. Students can get, can't get help at home because parents have nothing to work with. Therefore, our children are constantly at a disadvantage against their peers in neighboring districts. Then they flunk, t flunk tests and are not college ready. I also want to ch touch on a phone call I had made to central office. I called to inquire about why my child, who is a special education student, has no textbooks or workbooks. I started to explain my situation to Ms. Beeman and someone named Ashley just started talking without introducing herself. No one told me I was on speaker, which is very unprofessional and a HIPAA violation. Maybe I didn't want the entire office to hear my personal call. Then when I informed her how rude it was to jump in like that without introducing herself, she made another rude comment saying that I had not been talking. If I had not been talking so much, I would have heard her introduce herself. I responded that that was because people taught manners do not talk when someone else is talking. Then to have this individual try to talk to me like I'm not educated and be sarcastic. The behavior is unacceptable and it needs to be addressed immediately. Phone etiquette is a, is a must when dealing with, with us people. We're not animals. My questions to the board. Number one, what are, you do, what are you going to do about providing proper resources to schools so that they are prepared on the first day of school? What happened to the 100 book challenge? Surrounding districts have one of have one-to-one -one technology. With all the funding that our district receives, when will you be providing one-to-one -one technology for our children? We are in the digital age. What are you going to do to supply working and updated computers to all of our schools so that all of our children can be college ready? Research has shown, that, shown us that early childhood development is important to our children's education. What are you doing in these early years to promote a love for learning for our children? Your ship has no librarian. Reading is very important and needed to learn every other subject, including math. What are you doing to promote reading? What are you doing to make reading fun? What are you doing to provide fresh new books to capture and captivate our children's interests? The air conditioners in our classrooms are meant for bedrooms and we're supposed to be a temporary solution. What are you doing to prepare for our schools to be properly air conditioned through the extreme heat weather coming in the year, in 2016 year? Thank you, Ms. Ortiz, your time What is are up. you doing to prepare first time test takers and what accommodations do you have for them? And what are you doing to unit testing so that they are ready? What are you doing to ensure compliance with the school code and what are you doing to ensure that our children are ready for school? Thank you, Ms. Ortiz, your time is up. Number six, Shirley Nunez. Number six, Shirley Nunez. Number seven, Kevin Waters. Good evening, everyone. Congratulations, young people, for on your selection as school board representative. It is a great honor and uh, one that I'm sure you're going to fulfill without any difficulty. 
All right. Um, my main concern at this moment is not having a library in our building. It's already been echoed twofold. Uh, we deserve the same treatment as suburban schools. I read for you at the last meeting how Cherry Hill has all of those things in their schools. They don't have a larger district. They don't have as large a district as we have, but they have a functional library with a librarian. All we ask for is fairness. We also lost our vocational department. It appears a vocational component was not seen as a viable educational tool, which our students could have as a resource. It is disheartening to see those charter experiments get the materials to give their students a chance at their concept of education. Librarians have always been a staple in public schools. All we ask for is equal, not separate treatment. Remember Brown versus Board of Education said, education is not separate, but equal. I have made this statement to the board on another occasion. Some of our students will not and choose not to attend college. What are their vocational options if a vocational component is not available? A student who wants to be a mechanic can attend Camden County College, but they are better prepared if their formative education is received in a high school vocational classroom. Again, it appears the district decided that a vocational education was no longer necessary for at least Woodrow Wilson students. Pensacom receives all of the redirected funds to educate the vocational component, their vocational students. This has to change. Will you advocate, Mr. Superintendent, returning the wood shop, auto shop, and culinary classes back into our building at Woodrow Wilson? It would be, as I've already heard mentioned, it would be evidence of all schools rising. I want to end with letting you know, this is on a nice note. I want to end with letting you know of our first ever Say No to Violence Rockathon at Woodrow Wilson this Friday, 8 p.m. through Saturday, 8 a.m. at Woodrow Wilson. Students Against Violence Everywhere are asking for a donation of $1 for each hour they rock. Our goal is to raise $300. We will share this monetary, this money with the National Organization of SAVE. You can drop off a donation at our school between the hours of 8 p.m. Friday and 8 a.m. Saturday. There will be movies, games, and fun. If any advisory board member would like to donate a few minutes of rocking as, a, as well, that would be great. I just want to thank you in advance. I have some flyers here for our Rockathon, and I just want to say that this Rockathon at Woodrow Wilson High School is the first ever. Normally, these things are held in suburban schools, but what I want to say to our students is, it's because we're in the hood, don't, doesn't mean that we can't have the same thing that those kids in the suburbs do as well. So I hope that if I don't know if I got to give the security, he can pass this up to you all, that I would at least see one of you. I know Mr. Rahanifer is not going to be able to make it, um, but I'm sure that he's going to be encouraging our students. We need um, the media to come. I think I've spoken with um, Ms. Sukup, who was aware of this, to get some sort of publicity for this event because it is the first ever at our event. Have the school um, news reporters um, the uh, television station come out, film it. Uh, we're going to be rocking all night at Woodrow Wilson. We're just going, with the, with the thing that says, do the rock away, do the rock away, lean back. <laughs> That's what it says here. <laughs> so at Woodrow Wilson High School, we are striving to be better. We are doing better. And it's just another indication of our great students that we have at Woodrow Wilson High School. And we just know that you all as school board members and anybody here in the audience as well can come by, you can drive by, come up the ramp in the gym, we're gonna be in the gym area, come by, drop off a donation. If you got a sweet treat, if you make good things, uh, something sweet for our kids to have as they rock, um, you know, just to kinda, so I just hope that you guys will, will think about it, but again, I'm giving some security and I guess he'll uh, put it up there. So we're gonna rock on this Friday and we hope that you will rock with us, thank you. Number eight, Yonita Martin. Yonita Martin. Hi, 
My name is Yonita Martin. I live here in Camden with my two sons. I've spoken here multiple times now, so some of you may have already know my story. But I'm originally from Georgia, and since moving to New Jersey seven years ago, we lived in many places, including the suburbs, before moving back to Camden two years ago, which is my husband's hometown. My youngest son is Dante, and he's in the second grade at Mastery in North Camden. I'm sorry, he's in his second year at Mastery in North Camden. He's in the third grade, and he loves it. My oldest son, Dequaz, who is a seventh grader, attended Molina when we first moved to New Jersey, then a school in Lindenwald, then Blackwood, one in Gloucester City, and then a charter here in Camden before, and that was last year, before Mastery expanded and got Molina, and then now he's at Molina and he loves that school. And that school just ended up being a good fit for the family overall. I would like to thank the board for supporting the Renaissance School, and I'm hoping that you all are open to a high school option for them, because this is why I'm here tonight. I'm asking you all to do just a little bit more to support whatever mastery needs to start a high school. Parents met with the superintendent last week to discuss why they believe that there should be a high school in North Camden, particularly at Pine Point, when mastery um, elementary evacuates in 2017. Parents spoke and students spoke, and I had no intention of speaking at that meeting, but I was so moved by the students that made a plea for having a high school in North Camden that I got up and spoke my opinion too. On a grand scale, there is definitely a need for a high school in North Camden, but on a more personal level, it took us five years after moving here to find a school that fits our family. And that was right for Dequaz. I would hate for him to get a quality education at Mastery and then have to go to another school in two years when eighth grade is over because so far that's as far as mastery goes so um, I would just like him to have a school up to the 12th grade and I particularly wish it was a mastery high school Thank you. Um, number nine Nicole Goodman uh, good evening congratulations students and I spoke on the librarian issue last year, and just so everyone's clear that the district didn't find librarians to be of importance because they abolished their positions. So whether you know how to research or use an encyclopedia or um, which websites research um, bases are appropriate and not appropriate, I guess it wasn't important to them at the time. But being a school uh, student board, that's something you can advocate for for your peers. Um, I want to address some monies that was um, on the board minutes on page 107. I'm going back to September. Um, we're paying temp services 11,000. We're paying for Dreambox 96,000. That's not currently being used, and teachers were not trained. There's some confusion with High Nella Board of Ed. We've paid them 184,000 for construction repairs, smart board installation, Knox bar coating, and painting of Bonzo, more like painting of Uncommon. In addition, we also paid them on this board minutes 100, over $172,000 for camera maintenance. What I find confusing is that there are no schools under High Nella Board of Education, so who are we paying? Um, on the initial board minutes that was distributed in September, page 64, we're paying $35,000 to Camden County Sheriff Offices and Metro to provide outside employment for security at football and basketball games. Why not just give our security officers more overtime? We're paying landscaping, $120,000. And so it's just monies on the board minutes that just doesn't seem ethically correct. Now let's address some issues as far as student base. Forest Hill School. Currently, there are classes, self-contained classes being self-contained all day, even lunchtime. That is inhumane. We have, um, and it's a sad um, analogy I'm going to use, but at the time, this is how people are feeling. We have inmates who also have lunch with general population. These are students. They are in a self-contained program for learning disabilities, maybe behavior disabilities. If we do not allow them to engage and socialize with the quote unquote normal general education population, then how are they to learn what appropriate social behaviors look like? Um, I have a major concern with our special needs population. We're not servicing them. 
We're cutting services from them and we're not replacing them with anything. Are we hiring reading specialists to work with these students that's not being classified because the director feel we have too many kids classified? In addition, I noticed in the board minutes that um, even though they're on a separate budget, the preschool were allowed to order supplies. And like I said, I know they're on a special budget. However, contractually, our bilingual and special education department also should have that right to order the supplies needed to teach their population. And that's not being done. Thank in you, closing, Ms. Your time is up. In closing, I would just like to address how some of my assistant office staff. Effective as assistant office staff. Instead of reducing costs, this office has increased salaries for creative decisions. When will you see a company with hiring of two classes of public? Please share how you rate effectiveness because from my perspective, we need to increase tax for our 85% of your city office staff. Number 10, Claudia Cream. Good evening. I'm glad my schedule allowed me to be here this evening. I know I have not been here for a while, but let me just say this. Uh, Mr. Superintendent, surveys are anonymous. Individuals that come to present are presenting concerns that affect the school districts and community. These are real surveys because you can put faces to the concerns. So individuals should not be discounted or cut off when they're trying to express what was needed to better the community and the district. These are real surveys. My first point, and I'm going to give several points, and hopefully they'll be addressed at some point in time, but I'm addressing my points to those who are concerned, have a vested interest in this district, have a vested interest in the children and the community. The first concern is on page 72. I noticed that the chief family engagement officer is leaving, well, resign. This is an opportunity where someone from the community, from the city, can be a part of this position because all the positions I've noted have been individuals outside of the city. So this is an opportunity to have someone who is tied to the community in this position. We have a number of qualified individuals here whose talent and services are being negated. If you need some suggestions, those that are concerned know how to get in touch with me. The second issue, as I look around and part of the information has been coming to me from parents and different ones, is that the charter schools, some of their practices, the ideology is having a school to prison pipeline for our children. This needs to be looked into because the practices, if you do not have an urban orientation, you, don't know, you do not know what's best for our children. So those are concerned, if you need particulars, contact me. I heard the young people talk about the lunch program. That is concern too. What is the policy at the charter schools for lunch? I was very disheartened when I saw a charter school giving our children bag lunches at lunchtime. Another area, I've been hearing concerns about the hostile environments that are existing not only in the district, but in our schools. You need particulars, call me. Another area to look into, although I have not been here, I've been perusing the board minutes. There have been a number of job changes versus titles and positions. Some individuals have had three to four title changes with salaries that go along with it. That's a concern when last year this time, we had such a large deficit. So I think that needs to be looked into those who are concerned because if we don't have money for books, how are all these titles and salaries being changed? Thank you, Ms. Cream, uh, your time Another is up. issue, my last one, I know you're gonna cut me off. Number 11, Monique Ragsdale.
Good evening. Congratulations on the um, students. I know you guys will do a good job. Um, I actually just wanted to make a few statements um, to you, Superintendent. Um, when I told you about advertising for the schools, the Renaissance and Charters, this is a classic example. You know, as um, I do, I get a lot of calls and inquiries from the parents, and they call about complaints. When they call about complaints, they call about schools that are not our traditional public schools. Um, I think it's important that we clarify to the parents that we are this Camden School District who governs our public schools, the traditional public schools. They have their own board. We do not govern them and we're not accountable for what happens to them. And I think that should be clear and precise so that people can understand. Parents are very confused out there with the messages that are being had and given out and with even the literature and stuff. When you do something great, our students are on the rise and you have KIPP under there. That's not a traditional public school. We don't govern, we're not accountable for them. That's not what you are brought here to do, um, Payman Renifer, and that's just something that I just wanna bring attention because I get a lot of calls too. So um, because we do so much advocacy for education, parents feel comfortable and can they confide in us. And um, I can also you know, piggyback off of what Nicole Goodman said about special needs. We had um, huge concern about all of a sudden these kids who had IEPs that were getting trans transportation to schools, this year all of a sudden they don't get it. I looked up every legislation, I looked on the state, I looked under our um, rules and regulations, there's nothing that says that, so I wonder, I don't understand, and I don't wanna pry into their, you know, their personal business, but why did this transportation just stop when they've been getting bused to school from since K kindergarten? So that was one of my other concerns. And um, I also was um, reading about um, Tia Morrison leaving, and I did wanna um, make a recommendation, and it's just a recommendation, but um, you do have um, an employee who, who is qualified, who um, comes to our meeting. I always see her at the community engagement, things that we do for um, students, and that's, um, I think it's Sherry, Sherry Perry Thompson, I get her name confused, but she's at our meeting, she advocates for us. I see her at the games, I see her all the time, and um, I believe that she would be, you know, someone that you guys can recommend. I know that you guys always put out big things, and I, I agree with Ms. Cream. We need to start um, looking at people who are already in our district, and for long-term stability, we need somebody and who is familiarized with the community. All right, and um, that's basically all I had. Um, that's it. Oh, and um, this Thursday we're having a skating party for Camden High, so everybody's welcome to come out and bring their children. Thank you. Number. The time is 6 p.m. tonight at Millennium. Number 12, Nancy Ruiz. Nancy Ruiz. 13, Helen Ferrante. Good evening. Tonight I would like to discuss some important topics. First, the SGOs. We as teachers are able to create our own assessments by law. I brought this up at a meeting in the summer and I brought it up this last board meeting, which you did not respond to my questions. In October, the teachers were told that they could create our own assessments for our SGOs, but that all the data was due by October 15th. The special area, science, and social studies teachers were allotted time until October 22nd. When these teachers submitted their assessments, most assessments needed to be done over for various reasons. One reason was the need for open-ended and leveled questions. There were a certain number of questions that needed to be created. For map testing, there are not only, there are not any open-ended questions, and there are not too many questions in my opinion. There is no correlation between the two types of assessments. Some questions posed are not correct for the specific grade level, such as kindergarten punctuation marks. They do not reflect the state allotted curriculum or follow with the gold program. This was apparently recommended and told to you, but nothing was done considering kindergartners are still required to take the MAP test. Back to the SGOs. The teachers were not given enough time to be able to create their own assessments and to have their data collected and SGOs created by the deadline. I had suggested the use of our own assessments in the summer so you were well aware of the law and were not in compliance. Back to a different question covering the MAP test. 
Why are the teachers not given any type of sample questions and terminology to use within our classroom to aid our students? We are given sample questions for every other standardized test, such as the science asked for for fourth grade and even the park test. Second, the technology department. The ticket system does not work in a timely fashion. There are smart boards that have various problems with each of them and are still not functioning at their best level. Some of the smart board sound does not work. Some are not able to interact. Some will not interact but are not able to run an educational video. And some need a new cord or light bulb. Some classrooms do not even have a smart board yet. You want our students to compete with the other schools but do not give the basic technological support needed to get us there. And you paid Hynella a boatload of money for, to install new smart boards. Third, the weather climate in different schools. Some schools are cold while others are hot. Can we please get those schools regulated to a normal range temperature? It can become a health issue for certain medically fragile children. This will lead into a safety concern and should be addressed as soon as possible. On a final note, please address your staff, the parents, and the community on why it was stated at a workshop that you spoke at on September 22nd, 2015. One of the slides presented that it states, and I quote, within a few years, Renaissance and charter schools may have the capacity to enroll every student or almost every student in the city. Why was the previous mention? Where do you predict the Camden Public Schools to be in two years, five years, 10 years in the future? This may sound familiar because I asked these questions at the last board meeting and they were not answered. Thank you for your time. Number 14, Quinzel Bethea. Good evening. <laughs> okay, so um, just real briefly. Um, good evening, young lady and young men. Uh, that's, this, this right here, th these are our leaders. Um, and our association, I Hug, this is what we work with, working with uh, young people to get them into a position of leadership. You know, not in the future, but now, currently, today. Uh, so one of the main things that, um, that's kind of presented to me right now, and you know, I stated them before, and I would like to have like some off the record conversation with you guys is that um, our, our, I don't have a budget for our program. Um, and the schools that are wanting of our program, um, they're not given a budget on any after school program or any after school monies. Um, and none of it has been allotted. I've looked at the budget, I've seen it, um, worked hand in hand with these, um, with the secretaries and different things like that. And one thing that I do know is that when we want money for something, we can find it. Um, and the things that, you know, other things get pushed to the back burner. So um, just to talk briefly about what we do and I guess my journey today alone. Uh, so I wake up, <laughs> I go from meeting to meeting, and then um, I go make it my obligation to work with the young people at Dudley School. Uh, so I work with the population between second grade through eighth grade. As Soon as I walk in the door, the principal finds herself to meet me um, with a bunch of other teachers with a host of concerns. Uh, one in the class specifically um, is a third grade class that um, several children, they don't have, um, you know, they have very low literacy levels. Um, so we work with those, um, those children with very low literacy levels. Um, and we work with in like a man-to-man -man program right now. But anyway, this, this particular class has four different teachers in the class. It's, it's a, one class with four different teachers. And when I walked into the class today, the class is in disarray. Um, and this was one of the concerns that I brought to last, um, last month's board meeting, is the, is the culture and the climate control. Um, and what are we doing to infuse the climate um, or protect the climate of our schools? Um, like I said, you walk into the classroom, it doesn't look like a learning environment. Um, I responded to a teacher to get one of the young men's uh, work that was sent home from school because he was running up and down the hallway. And the teacher said, what? and immediately corrected herself and said, um, excuse me, Mr. Q, you know, how, how may I help you? Um, but, you know, I don't blame her. It, it is, it's really the support of, I don't know um, how much professional development they're getting um, or, you know, what's the budget of their professional development. Um, we've done professional development with them. Um, and, you know, like, just like any other contractor, um, my services can only extend but so far uh, without being paid or compensated. Um, but. Neither here or there, um, one of the main things that I would like to see get done is putting our young people in a position of leadership um, so that it would be nice for them to um, start coming around to the schools, 
um, you know, and began so that they can see, okay, this is what leadership looks like. Um, it's a concept what sociologists call informal social control. So if we present these leadership models like student government associations, some debate teams, different things like that, students will say, okay, well, like I wanna be like them. Uh, we did a pep rally last, last week and um, you know, the, the dynamic of the school is beginning to change and a few other different things. So like, that's, that's one thing I would like to see incorporated um, is just the climate control and what are we doing? Are we, do we have a climate control team or, or do we have um, any type of team that is working with the development of that and to get our children in some type of program, some type of debates or anything like that. Thank you, um, Mr. Bethea, thank you. your time is up. And that ends public comment. All right, so I'm gonna respond to some of the questions and issues that were raised. As always, I'm gonna ask our Deputy Superintendent, Ms. McCombs, to jump in here and there. Is Mr. Benson still here? So he was our first speaker, and I'm gonna go ahead and respond to the points he made even though he left, because it's no secret that we haven't always seen eye to eye on a lot of different issues, but can't condone false allegations. So the first is that we have rampant vacancies and that we are deliberately trying to uh, injure uh, the demise of our public schools. I forget the exact words that he used. So let me be clear about this. We started the school year where 96% of our classrooms had a full-time teacher, so 4% there were vacancies, and for those 4%, uh, nearly all of them had a long-term sub, meaning a certified teacher in front of the classroom. So 98, 99% of our classrooms had a certified teacher. And the vacancies are driven by, by uh, high-need staffing areas, which is a national challenge. It is not unique to Camden in areas of mathematics, science, special education. There are not enough certified teachers nationwide. And I tell a lot of our young people that uh, if you're interested in going into education and you have a passion for special education, math, or science, move in that direction because you will have job security once you get out of college. And so I'm not sure where he's getting his facts from, but I wanted to immediately address that because it is far from reality. To the general point that the work we are doing is leading to the demise of public schools, it's absolutely nonsense. If you look at outcomes, if you look at instructional outcomes, you look at what's happening in all of our school buildings, we see real signs of progress. Graduation rate is up. Pre-K enrollment is up. Students are feeling safer. And for those that, that believe Renaissance schools aren't doing the city any good, go talk to the 2,000 families that are enrolled in Molina, in McGraw, in East Camden Middle, and ask them what they think about the education they're receiving as our traditional district schools are also improving. So anybody who cares to make that claim, I will always respect where you're coming from, but let's play with the same facts. Let's stick to the facts. Ms. Jocelyn, uh, a number of you all raised comments about librarians. Uh, and so I believe um, Ms. Goodman, you also raised that point. You, uh, and as you noted, you've been stating this for the past two years, maybe even longer. So let me first say, yes, it is true. We do not have full-time librarians in all of our schools. And yes, perhaps in other schools, in Cherry Hill, Haddonfield, I can't corroborate, but I assume it's true, they do have librarians. What is also true is that we have more staff for the number of students than Cherry Hill, than Haddonfield. We have more adults working inside of our schools. And for anyone that's shaking their heads, come prove it otherwise. Don't shake your head and tell me that I'm lying to you. Show me the data because I have the data. We are more richly staffed in Camden because we spend more. We spend $24,000 per pupil, whereas Cherry Hill spends closer to 13, 14,000. So literally we have more resources. And so it comes to a trade-off conversation where inside of our schools, we have decided to have cl smaller classroom sizes, which again, that's, look at the ratios. We, we have smaller classroom sizes here in Camden than almost anywhere else in the state and country. And that's what our school leaders have told us is the priority over a full-time librarian. Now, thanks to the leadership of our principals, our vice principals, lead educators, and our teachers, we find creative solutions. We're still able to take uh, a large number of students into our libraries. We have volunteers. It's not to say that if we had more money, we wouldn't staff a librarian. If we had infinite resources, of course we would have a librarian. But resources are finite. And again, relative to everywhere else in the state, we are very generously funded. So it's a trade-off conversation. And if certain schools believe that a librarian trumps an additional classroom teacher, let's have that conversation with the school leader. For next year, we can make the class size go up slightly in a certain school and staff a full-time librarian. Happy to have that conversation. 
Mr. Farmer, you raised questions, grievances, SGOs, the 85% of certain schools. Uh, we'll make sure Emily reaches out to you. Uh, let's put it on our check-in agenda. Uh, it's an involved conversation, and as with all grievances, like let's, let's just continue to have those conversations with our team. Ms. Ortiz, you raised some questions about various reading strategies and what we're doing to engage students. Is she still here? So she left, we'll follow up with her separately. Uh, Mr. Waters, you raised the, the librarian issue as well, which I just responded to. With vocational education, I think the words you use, something has to change. I certainly agree with you that some, something has to change. As we've announced, we are creating a vocational school at Camden High School. Happy to have a conversation about the programming availability at Woodrow Wilson High School, uh, but the plan is to move forward with a vocational school at Camden High. Ms. Goodman, you raised um, a com you made a comment about Dreambox and, uh, and how it's potentially not being used, and, or maybe you're just raising the question of how it's being used. I wanted Ms. McCombs to quickly comment on that. And Ms. Goodman, thank you for your concerns. Anything that I may not address here, we can definitely talk offline, one-on-one. -on -one. But Dreambox is, um, I think, uh, what I heard you saying is that uh, it wasn't available uh, across the board for all of our teachers to utilize in our classrooms, and it is available. Um, we had a teacher roundtable in this building um, about an, that ended about an hour before this board meeting began, and we were able to talk to teachers about their implementation of Dreambox um, in areas where it could be refined, but also areas where they were seeing promise. Um, Dreambox is a formative assessment, and it's computerized, and it's used specifically for math, so it is a very focused assessment but it is available. However, there, if there's a techno technology issue in a classroom, I definitely would like to know the specifics so we can track it down. Um, but that, that was the first that I was hearing that it was not available to our schools and we can definitely talk about it. You also raised a question about QSAC. We asked the state for where things stand on QSAC. We're just waiting to hear back from them. As soon as the results are available, we'll of course share them out. You raised an issue about launch at Forest Hill. First, I had heard that specific concern. Let's take that one offline in the same conversation with Mr. Farmer to better understand what's going on there. Uh, Ms. Ragsdale, and by the way, before I forget, with Ms. Ortiz, I know she had to cut out because she had some family responsibilities. If someone has a phone number for her, can you please pass it along to us and we'll just give her a call to more directly address her questions. Um, Ms. Ragsdale, I appreciate where you're coming from in that the district has direct governance over traditional public schools uh, and not over charter schools and not over renaissance schools. What I would respectfully submit is that, one, we do have contracts with renaissance schools, so there is some degree of oversight there, stipulating what the needs are, ensuring that they're serving all students. We're working to build an enrollment system which affects all schools. Um, so there, there is some overlap. We have shared service agreements, so there is a lot of overlap in that sense. So that's the technical response that I would again respectfully submit. But I would also say that I do, and we can agree disagree on this, I do feel a responsibility to all students in Camden because if it's not this body, if it's not me and the board members that we have sitting before you, no one is thinking about the greater good of the city. And so what you have is kind of wasted, not wasted efforts, but you have inefficiencies with one school just tending to itself, another school tending to itself, the district tending to itself, and there's no broader dialogue. And that's not what we want, where you have kind of separate enclaves with walls up and people just kind of fighting amongst each other. Instead, we're trying to willingly collaborate uh, and communicate with our partners. I, 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 and I really do appreciate where you're coming from. It hasn't taken away from fiercely advocating on behalf of our kids. When we do our district highlights, you don't see much of any Renaissance School students. We don't have Renaissance School students sitting on our student board. Uh, so we will continue to fiercely advocate for our students. That is our primary charge. But I do think that if it's not this body thinking about all schools, nobody's thinking about all schools. And I think that leads to certain inefficiencies and certain complications. So I'm glad you raised that because th this has come up a lot where a parent of a Renaissance School student comes to us. And, and this is, again, kind of the collective responsibility and us being connective tissue to other schools. We will, we will 
connect them to the right people at the Renaissance School. So I wouldn't say that she should have to go to her board. She can absolutely come to us, and it's a, a simple phone call to connect that individual to the right person at, at Cape Cooper North Cross or at Master or whatnot. So, and, okay. Family Community Engagement Team. And, Gotcha. All right. All right. Well, I mean, this is helpful. And so moving forward, feel free to connect them to our Division of Family Community Engagement. Uh, Ms. Cream raised um, uh, the suggestion, as did uh, Ms. Ragsdale, about looking internally uh, in the search process for a uh, family community engagement leader and we will we will certainly look internally as well as look externally we're gonna uh, as, as, as we always do uh, think about local talent and um, and thank you for your suggestions there uh, in in respect to Ms. Cream's comment about charters and the word she used school to prison pipeline I just want to quickly mention that uh, at mastery schools there is a restorative justice approach I haven't spoken to other charter schools and Renaissance schools about it specifically but I have mentioned that we are taking a restorative justice approach and the mastery schools have that same approach they have something called a restorative circle which they do once a week with their students and so they are actively trying to reduce suspensions of their schools as well uh, and again I'm not sure what some of the other schools are doing but I did want to point that out So, Ms. Ferrante, you raised uh, a number of concerns about SGOs, and I wanted um, our deputy superintendent to respond to that. So, Ms. Ferrante, thank you very much for um, your questions, and I, I try to get everything down, and as I always say, if I miss anything, <coughs> we can definitely link up afterwards. But I wanted to, to speak specifically to um, your concerns about teachers who were able to create their own assessments, which, by law, teachers are able to do that. Um, it's outlined in DOE, gui DOE guidelines and um, the policies that are in place. So the Office of Evaluation did make allowances for this, as you um, alluded to, and provided suggested assessments and targets to all teachers. Teachers that did not want to use the suggested assessments did have the opportunity to complete the assessment development process. And as long as their assessments met um, a minimum bar of rigor, because we want to make sure that the assessments are not just assessments in isolation, but they're connected directly to student outcomes, which is the original intent for SGOs, as long as those assessments met that bar, um, that is fine. Those assessments that were returned to teachers did not quite meet the bar. However, the Office of Evaluation is committed to still working with those teachers so that they can make the necessary adjustments and corrections so that those SGOs are ready for a February <coughs> submission. So I'm not sure if maybe um, there's some misinformation out there. I'd be happy to clarify it, but there is still time for teachers to continue with the, uh, making those submissions of the alternate assessments that they have, that they are recommending that they're able to make. Um, you also mentioned sample questions. Was it for MAP? Sample questions for MAP. So we can discuss that. Um, what we want to do is make sure that while we're offering professional development and while we're talking about assessment, we look at it from a high level and we really understand this assessment. The purpose of it is to drive instruction and to make sure that we also are able to see how well our students have advanced. So that's why we have formative and summative assessments and MAP is an assessment that's unique because it help, helps us to really be able to see how much our students are growing as they are given the different um, assessments. So we did not provide samples and any professional developments around sample questions for Matt, but definitely um, we can talk more because I'm, I'm not sure if I understand completely what it is that you would like to see. Because if, if I'm not understanding, we can connect and then it may be possible that I can talk to the senior lead educators and we can adapt the training around some of your, your uh, questions. So I just want to make sure that I'm very clear about what it is you're asking because I don't think it's just for sample questions for MAP. I think it goes a little bit deeper, but I'd be happy to connect with you afterwards. And thank you for your questions. And Ms. Franta, you also raised building conditions and I believe a couple other people did as well. And to that I say, yeah, Absolutely, uh, half our buildings constructed before 1928. You all have heard me say that ad nauseum at this point. 
And whenever the building issues come up, we just address them as quickly as we can. But sometimes it's plain whack-a-mole because when you have buildings that are this old, there's only so much you can do. Now, we're always going to move with a sense of urgency whenever those issues come up. So Cream School, there was a heating issue. We got on it right away. In our central office building, the heat and AC goes in and out. I mean, we're, we're suffering through it as well, which is why that's the second promise of the Cabinet Commitment, which is why we're aggressively moving to partner with Renaissance schools to allow for the renovations of, of those facilities, uh, which is why the Camden High uh, facility renovation is so important. So uh, again, it's something that we are keenly aware of, and uh, you know, thank you for raising the concern. Um, Mr. Bethea, you mentioned that we should take the conversation offline, so we'll find someone to continue that conversation, thank you for all you're doing for the students at Dudley. <clears throat> and Ms. Gooden, uh, we're gonna make sure that Ms. you and Ms. Robinson will connect here after the meeting. If there's anything else you wanna discuss with us, I'm uh, certainly happy to, to take that offline. Thank you all very much, have a great evening. Uh, excuse me, we're gonna do the close out, yes. Uh, Felicia, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I just had a comment just for the public. Whoever needs any information or help regarding any and all schools, any issues and you don't know necessarily to contact. I know all of us board members are on Facebook. Contact us. Our email's on the district website. Um, send us the sh email. Um, we're constantly all day, every day addressing issues about schools, garbage, alleys. I mean, so just reach out to us if you feel like you're having a hard time reaching the right person. Any other comments before we adjourn? Okay. At this time, I call for a motion to adjourn the meeting. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Motion to adjourn the meeting was made by Ms. Atwood and Minister Muhammad. All in favor of adjourning the meeting say yes. 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 All opposed say no. The meeting is now adjourned.